The newest Five Nights at Freddy's movie trailer made me realize that it's been way too long since I did a FNAF-focused episode. I mean, the last one was the FNAF Zombie Apocalypse video, like, nine months ago or something. And because I've already turned FNAF animatronics into dragons and mech armors and a few other things, I wasn't sure what angle I wanted to go with this episode, so I thought I'd just do the same thing that I did with Rainbow Friends a few months back, where I take some of the characters out of it and turn them into a whole bunch of different types of monsters. So let's see how that goes, shall we? Let's go! Hit like, if you want. Subscribe! if you feel like, but either way, enjoy the show. Good evening, everyone. The SCP subcategory we will be focusing on today is not one I would usually be involved in giving lectures about. Unfortunately, Dr. Matthew Patrick is not currently with us, as attempting to constantly piece together how all the SCPs he studies in this category are interconnected and unraveling the history of them has driven him somewhat mad. As a result, he has been permitted to take the Foundation's extended mental health sick leave, meaning he should return in three days. Normally, Agent Mark Fishbach would take over for him in this case, but he has been sent on a mission in orbit, so I am left to attempt to explain to you a topic that, frankly, I am ill-prepared to illuminate you on. Though, I will do the best I can to explain today's entity in the subcategory of SCP-F. Item number, SCP-F912. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. F912 is a digital entity that is to remain contained in a closed circuit network currently run through Site-15. Thankfully, while some systems such as this were damaged in recent containment breaches involving entities of the SCP-D subcategory, F912's network was not harmed. Interactions with this entity are only possible by utilizing the item SCP-F910, a virtual augmented neural network integration mask, though interactions with F912 have thus far proven fruitless in regards to learning more about it. Description F912 can only be witnessed while wearing the neural network mask, and while wearing said mask, the entity appears as a skeletal phantasmal humanoid rabbit. It has largely purple flesh that is constantly breaking and repairing itself. Its hands are attached to its elbows via streams of electricity, and it has metallic wiring running through its waist, torso, and arms. This entity was found by Dr. Patrick's team at a defunct children's restaurant, and while confirmation of this has not yet been made, it seems to be a program developed to control the artificially intelligent computer systems of the restaurant and to contain another entity that is now within SCP custody. F912 was able to take control of the cameras, doors, and even the bodies of the advanced animatronics once utilized in the restaurant to entertain guests. F912 would utilize these to attempt to stop people from entering this site, ensuring that the contained entity inside remained trapped. Though if I had personally programmed this entity, the first thing I would have done was set it up to convey a message to those who enter the site that it is containing a dangerous entity within that should not be released. Anyhow, when Dr. Patrick and his team were on location investigating, they got no such message and ended up releasing the entity, classified SCP-F913, which has a physical form as the endoskeleton of one of the aforementioned animatronics and is capable of mimicking the voice of anyone it hears, much like SCP-939. This entity attacked the doctor's team, killing two of them before they were able to restrain it and bring it into containment for study. It appears the entity has its own unique artificial intelligence system that appears to be corrupted in a way we have not yet fully understood, though thus far it is theorized that the source of this corruption is supernatural in nature. Anyhow, taking SCP-F912 into Foundation custody was much easier given its lack of physical form. The computer systems of the restaurant were transferred into a Foundation-owned closed network, and the entity no longer has control over anything in the physical world. Hopefully, Dr. Patrick will return to us soon, so he may take over lectures about the SCP-F entities once more, but for now I fear that attempting to explain their history myself would drive me as mad as the doctor has gone. So, for today, I will end our lecture here.
I always like a good challenge when it comes to smashing kaiju, and man did I have my work cut out for me with this recent one. Went over to the states to help out some kaiju slayers there with this set of beasts running around in Utah. One of the slayers there, pretty young guy to be hunting kaiju to be honest, named Greg, had managed to get this big bear looking kaiju onto our side of the fight. But they still needed some pretty heavy hitting power when the Mongrader showed up. That's the name of this 250 foot tall alligator looking kaiju with an axe like plate sticking out of the top of its head and a tail that can wipe out a skyscraper in a single swipe. This thing had first popped up in Washington County, but by the time it was spotted again it was stomping right into Salt Lake City and was ready to cause a lot of trouble. Greg and his big beastly bear probably could have handled it, but then this massive purple wolf kaiju showed up at pretty much the same time, so Greg had his hands full with that. Of course, I wasn't too upset about it because it meant I got the gator all to myself. I started with my power at around 10% or so, just taking swipes at its legs to see how tough it was. And man was it. Real aggressive kaiju too, it stomped on me, smacked me with its tail, and tried to chomp me in its mouth about 20 different times. Eventually I realized I was going to have to go pretty hard to take this thing out, so I gave it a 70% power hurricane hammer punch right to its jaw. Dislocated it, but wasn't enough to take the thing out. At least then I had its attention though. I lured it out of the city and into the mountains. Kept the thing chasing me for ages, but finally got it up to a cliff that I figured was high enough. I deked back behind the thing and gave it the hardest tackle I could without knocking myself out by overusing my powers. The big beastie fell something like two kilometers down and landed right on its head, cracking its neck. Pretty sure that thing ain't getting up again, but if it does, I'd be happy to come back for round two. Now I knew I wanted to do one FNAF animatronic as a kaiju for this episode. I mean, I've done a bunch of them as dragons and Monty Gator specifically as a dragon. And I will say, even though that, that FNAF Dragons episode is, what, two years old now? The second one where he showed up? I still think I like that dragon better than how this one turned out. Like, I like this drawing enough, it just kind of feels a little bit flat and a little bit bland in comparison to some of my other kaiju drawings this year. I mean, I haven't actually done a ton of kaiju drawings, but there are some that just really stand out to me as some of my favorite things I've done this year. Like, I really liked my uh, Pacific Rim Jaeger as a kaiju drawing, and my, um, my green rainbow friend as a kaiju. Those really stand out to me as some of my best of this year. And this one just you know, feels a little bit boring. Maybe it's also because I'm comparing it to my recent Pokemon Monster Hunter fusion drawings, and those are just some of the best creatures I've drawn in ages, and they're not kaiju, but, you know, feels like that similar sort of ballpark. But I don't know, it might also be that I'm a little harsher on this one, because this one took me almost six hours to do, whereas the other drawings in this episode, which I all like better, only took around three hours each. But maybe this is just a case where I'm being too harsh on it in the moment. There's plenty of times where I strongly critique something and then look back on it later and end up liking it more. Because this one's formatted in the right proportions to put it up as a poster, I'll put it up as a poster on the Popcross Studios Teespring store because maybe some of you like it a lot more than I do. That'll be linked in the comments, but let's take a look at the finished result. Often the wretches that I assist the Van Helsing family in hunting are individual creatures or beings that have been cursed or otherwise supernaturally deformed in some regard, but there are also cases where they have hunted grander scale threats. There are some beings that rank higher as their more elusive targets who themselves create more and more monstrous menaces to the safety of civilians. One of these such beings is a man named Wilsaveth Afton, whom I have quite literally watched Annalise Van Helsing slay, and yet he still manages to run amok, creating more beasts and creatures for us to contend with. Next time, I fear we may have to cut his body to pieces, then salt and burn it to ensure he does not return once more. Always a grim sight to bear. Wilsaveth started out as a tavern owner with a dangerous fascination with the occult and eventually began delving into necromancy and satanic magic. He found that anyone could learn to use powerful spells and sorcery, so long as they were willing to kill to activate such abilities. Revealing his clear lack of morals, Wilsaveth would take the lives of the children in his town in order to use their blood and life essence as sacrifices for his spells. It's still unclear to us if his ultimate aim is for some form of vengeance or for power, 
though my personal suspicion is he simply enjoys the thrill of the magic he can harness, and could not care less about who he must harm to utilize it. One of the first spells he cast was on a pirate captain that docked his crew in Wilsbeth's town for an evening. The pirates came into his tavern and caused far more damage than Wilsbeth was willing to tolerate, and so he set his sights on their captain, Christoph Foxworth. Likely inspired by the man's name, Wilsbeth used the blood of a child he'd recently killed to concoct a curse of vulpanthropy. And so, the very night his men ransacked Wilsbeth's tavern, the captain was transformed into a werefox and slayed his entire crew. The creature has since been hunted constantly by the people of Wilsbeth's village and the others nearby. While he has survived every assault lane towards him, he has sustained many, many injuries, leaving his vulpanthrope form in a withered and nightmarish state. And sadly, he is but one of the many creatures made by Wilsbeth's dark magic that the Van Helsings have yet to hunt down and either slay or cure. But in keeping their priorities in line, they deem it much more important to find Wilsbeth himself to ensure his tirade of monster-making is finally ceased. Now lately, as I've been doing a lot of different creature episodes with the Pokemon Monster Hunter fusion episodes and stuff, I've been, I feel like I've been trying to go bigger and bigger and bigger and add more details and make things crazier and more dramatic looking, and the drawings have been taking longer and longer, like with that kaiju drawing. But this one was a good, solid reminder that I can do a simple design that doesn't take a crazy amount of time that I really like the result of. I mean, it is very clearly less detailed than some of the other creatures I've been doing lately, but, and, and I, you know, I probably could have used another little layer of cell shading just to add a little bit more detail into the furs, but overall I think this is just a really cool pose, a cool design, and I like it better than the kaiju drawing in this episode, even though it took, like, half the time. I think I probably should have gone one way or the other in making this more like Nightmare Foxy and more withered and destroyed and torn apart, or just gone with classic Foxy and added the, uh, the eye patch and kept it a little bit more, you know, maybe even put a little bit more pirate clothing onto it. But that is kind of just a little nitpick. I still really like how this looks. And it's really nice dipping back into the Folklore series, which I've never gotten an episode in this series to really take off views-wise, but I also realized that every episode I've made in this series I've done during the summer, which is a time when I find videos tend to get less views anyway, and it's harder to get a video to take off. So I might have to try another full episode in this series in around October, when views tend to go up more, and of course it's spooky month, so it's more fitting. Bust our Terminax Mission Log Quest 5 under new directives. This wasn't exactly my mission, but I teamed up with one of my new buds, Quadrich, to go hunt down a bunch of xenomorphs that were apparently made by some sick freak that takes kids and infects them with xeno embryos. Obviously, kid killing puts this guy dead on my hit list. I may not kill monsters anymore, but you do something as messed up as killing kids, and I ain't letting you carry on breathing. I used to have a sort of stepbrother that did that kind of stuff, and I let it slide briefly because we were family, but I told him if he ever did it again, I'd chop his snargin' arms off. And the punk clearly didn't realize that Bustar Terminax doesn't bluff. Anyway, we didn't find this guy we were looking for, but we did manage to hunt down at least one of his creations, out in this space station on Cawthon 5. We're still thinking there's a bunch of other Xenos running around nearby, because there were a few bodies that clearly had Xenos leap out of them, but we were only able to find this one and get it into a transport cell. It's got a pretty bright red and purple hide with some extra tough armored plating. The plates on its head can close off to block its mouth and protect its face. But what I really didn't expect from this thing was that it didn't just have one of those second Xeno mouths inside its regular mouth. It had an even bigger one like a claw that could pop out of its chest. That one nearly got you, didn't it, Quadrich? Didn't think a Xeno like that would be able to take on a guy with Tetramand and Tyranid DNA like you. Jeez, you got a mouth on you, bud. I was just cracking a joke. It, is he actually mad? Hey, hey, Chip, can you go check on him for me? Will do, Bostar. While I am your personal emotional support companion, I will do all I can to assist Quadrich as well. Thanks, Chip. I'll chat with him when I wrap this up. Anyway, to be totally honest, even though I'm glad I'm not killing the stuff I hunt anymore and taking it to the nature preserve instead, felt a bit twisted keeping this one alive given it burst out of the chest of a kid. 
But I know it wasn't the critter's fault, it was just going through its natural life cycle. Makes me all the more ready to find and take out this guy, whoever he is that's making these Xenos though. Don't know if Quadrich and I'll get to him before some other bounty hunter does, cause I'm pretty sure a lot of folks are after him. But I tell you this, if we get to him first, I ain't bringing him in alive. Now because I've been having so much fun with my Alien and Xenomorph and Bustar Terminax episodes, I knew I wanted to do at least one Xenomorph in this episode, and the decision to use Circus Baby was admittedly a little bit arbitrary, but I did like the idea of getting to work with the faceplate that can open up, though I don't think I did anything super interesting with it in that. I, I don't think in this drawing it's one of the more interesting elements. Overall, I do like this drawing, it's just that specifically doesn't really stand out to me as one of the particularly cool parts of this. I think I probably did something more interesting with that when I did the Demogorgon from uh, Stranger Things as a Xenomorph back before my Bustar Terminax series even started. I think it was the first full Xenomorph episode I ever did, Famous Monsters as Xenomorphs. But anyway, overall I like the design of this one. I think it gets a little bit clunky at parts. Like, I think it could have made it a bit better if I made the neck longer so that the the busyness of the head didn't blend into the busyness of the chest and shoulders. But overall, I still think this is quite cool, and I love when there's a random episode like this that I just arbitrarily decide to use as a way to throw in some significant multiverse tales lore, like Bustar's little mention of what he did to his half-brother, but, you know, that'll probably also get elaborated on further in a proper multiverse tales episode. Anyway, let's take a look at the finished result of the last drawing today. If you enjoyed this, I highly recommend checking out my Five Nights at Freddy's Zombie Apocalypse Story episode. I know it sounds like a weird concept, but I think it's one of the best episodes I've made. And if it starts getting traction again, maybe I'll finally make that sequel episode. Also, all the high-resolution art and inks from this episode are up on the Popcross Studios Patreon, where art and inks go up a day before a video is released. But besides that, that's all for today, except, of course, for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note. And the thought I want to leave people with is a quote I read earlier this week that says, Growing up is realizing how many things don't deserve your energy. You get to decide what you focus your attention on, and while a lot of things in our world will try to draw you in a fearful and hateful direction, the more you choose to focus on things that benefit you and the people in your life and the positive things in your life, the happier and better your life is going to be. I hope that's inspiring, I love you all, and I'll see you in the next episode on Monday. Goodbye.